Thank you, David Ross. You know, David Ross and I went to Syracuse University together. Thank you, David Rhodes, Anthony Rhodes, and members of the board. And most important, the graduates of the class of 2021. I recognize your accomplishments in this most difficult year. You have earned all our admiration. I'm honored to be here. The invitation came as a complete shock. I am an unlikely commencement speaker. I was never the person voted most likely to succeed. I was always a disruptor and a troublemaker. I was born in Shreveport, Louisiana and grew up in South Florida, which in the 60s was a cultural desert and the land of no parents. What I mean by that is people would go to Florida to escape. It was like Las Vegas today, I think. Jim Crow was in full effect. Segregation was everywhere. Women were expected to know their place and abortion was illegal everywhere. I was constantly, constantly sent to the principal's office for taking, talking back to my conservative evangelical teachers. <clears throat> I used my artistic talent in a very specific way. At age 16, I was arrested for buying alcohol for myself and my friends. I had braces on my teeth, and there was no way I looked 21. I had those metal braces on every tooth, too. The cop knew I wasn't of age, but he couldn't figure out because my license looked so real. He put me in jail. He kept asking me whose driver's license this was, and I kept saying, it's mine. And he kept me there all night. He actually fingerprinted me and booked me. And finally, at dawn, I admitted that I had forged the driver's license. He had no idea because I had done such a great job. What I never told the cop was that I had a small word of mouth business changing kids' driver's licenses. My only accomplishment up to that point was that I could draw better than anyone else. I could draw a typewritten number that looked so real. So word got out that I could forge driver's licenses. Other wayward kids would send me $5, their driver's licenses, and a stamped return envelope. Now this was my first foray into making any money from art. <clears throat> it only took me 30, 35 years to make another dime in art. So I always tell students, don't go into this if you have, unless you have no choice. Or you have to go into this with love, or from love. Thank God for paying teaching gigs. I love teaching, and that is how I've survived in New York City. I've been teaching at SVA for 35 years. I visit my student studios with the goal of being of service. I never want to make someone into a mini mentor or squeeze them into the zeitgeist. The very best advice I can give to young artists is starting out is to make your art from love. It always shows if you don't. Follow your strengths. If something comes easily to you, do not disregard it. You know that painting or the project or that video, sculpture, whatever that came really easy and because it, it just flowed out of you, well, that's probably your authentic voice. And you're always told, well, challenge yourself. You know, you think to yourself, this can't be this easy. But trust me, I really believe it is this easy. This is the voice you should follow. <clears throat> what comes easily is probably your most authentic voice. Don't try to follow the movement of the moment. Make your work from your truth. Trust your inner voice even when you, when you are insecure and have no confidence. Most art has to fail before it succeeds. Remember that failure and rejections are your, are your teachers. Take that risk. Follow that instinct. <clears throat> Trust me, I'm speaking from experience. Soon after I came to New York, I tried to make abstract gestural paintings so I could fit into the German Expressionist movement that was everywhere. Realism was a dead end, totally dismissed. 
I couldn't get anyone to come to my studio. I took my slides around. Nobody would even call me back. Now, since I could copy anything, the paintings I made looked pretty, you know, gestural. They, they looked uh, like they were um, a spontaneous, but they were so bad. They were inauthentic and fake looking. I just wanted to feel like part of the current dialogue, but it was my big mistake. That's when I learned to embrace what I had fun doing. I was good at creating paintings from my photos. It came easy to me. I love to do labor-intensive paintings and spend hours building up surfaces. Whenever I lost track of time while I worked, I realized that that's where I needed to be, in the zone. That's when things just flow. This has never changed. Sometimes it's agonizing to get it right, but if I know it's right and the work is communicating with other artists and with other people, there's no better feeling in the world. That feeling unfortunately doesn't last long and I have to do it all over again. You just can't work from a formula. You have to keep stretching and expanding to make new things. Okay, so let's talk about today. The political unrest that we are all facing right now parallels the tremendous social upheaval that I witnessed in my student days. People were on the streets protesting for civil rights and against the Vietnam War. It was a time rife with sexism, racism, homophobia, and inequality. Feminism and the pill were brand new words. I never had a female teacher at the University of Florida, and I never had one in grad school at Syracuse University. My first class was all white and all boys, except for me. And some of them were just there to avoid being drafted and sent to Vietnam. This was 1970. College students were just beginning to find their voice, protesting the Vietnam War. And then the Kent State Massacre happened. The Ohio National Guard opened fire on a crowd of students who had gathered to peacefully demonstrate. This was a real tipping point and was a unifying moment for students across the country. After Kent State, we students went on strike, we shut down the university, we shut down Syracuse and at least 400 other university and schools across the United States. Then we went to Washington, D.C. and marched with thousands and thousands of other students against the war. I found my like-minded people in grad school and we supported each other in protest, in our studios, and in our personal lives. We became each other's community we had each other's back. I want you to stay close to the art community you've met and made this year and all the years you've been in school. These are the people that are gonna to come to your studio when no one else will. I'm friends with people I went to school with, you know, for 30 years now, 40 years. I have learned more from my fellow students than I ever did in class. Now, this has been a horrible year. <clears throat> coronavirus and isolation, massive unrest across the globe. Racial tension, sedition, voter suppression, democracy hanging by a thread. And then on top of all that, fucking classes on Zoom. Ah, oh, what a horrible year. I know it's hard to believe now, but I have witnessed progress. We inch closer to a more just society every day. Two steps forward and one step back seems to be the reality. Same with making your work. For every good piece of art you make, you've got 200 failures, or at least I do. <laughs> Once you find your authentic voice, trust it. If a rule doesn't make sense, break it. Act on that impulse to fight injustice. We are artists, and it is our, respons it is our responsibility to break the rules. It's part of the creative process. Change is in the air. Your generation can come out of this awful period and change the world. It takes creative people, inventive people like you, to make great art, find solutions, and lead the way. Silence is no longer an option. I'm counting on you. Thank you.